Hi, welcome to my next Bridgerton reading vlog. So saying this at the front, I don't know whether this will be um, books two and three or if it'll just be book two. Um, it really all depends on how much I have to say and how much blog, blog footage I end up putting in. Um, but I had so much fun doing it for the Duke and I that I basically decided I'm just going to keep doing it for the whole series. So maybe there'll be an episode for every book or maybe I'll mash them together if I end up on like a streak or something. But I think it'll just be really fun to actually vlog every read that I have. So I wanted to start this out with a quick haul because one of these items should be my hardcover of the Duke and I. Where is my knife go? And I also got some other books that I ordered. So the current I currently have the two copies of The Viscount Who Loved Me. That's what I meant to say. Um, I have this paperback, which I was hoping was going to be the hardback, but the eBay store selling this to me, they accidentally clicked hardback instead of paperback. But it still is one. So this is my original, which didn't have a step back in it. So this one, even though it didn't have a back, like it wasn't hardback, it did have the step back. Um, and I think this is one of the original printings. Nope, this was a third printing, but it was a printing from um, 2000, so it was close to when it came out. But I'm trying to get hardcovers of all of them. And it was funny because I just wanted to start reading it today, even though I wanted to annotate the hardcovers. And then I finally got mine in the mail. So, oh, yes, oh, I'm so happy. It is the one with it on the back too. Oh yes, I'm so happy. So this is almost perfect. Um, I had to order this one from Thriftbook and then you just kind of have to guess and see if it's gonna be the one with the back. But it is, ah! <laughs> so I'm so excited. And it's just in time to read it. Oh my God, I am thrilled. There's a couple of them that I ordered them and they didn't have the step back on the back. So I need to keep ordering until I get them. But I think I have six out of the eight with the back. Oh my God, it's perfect. Ugh, I'm so happy. So let's just open the other stuff that I ordered too. Because I put a haul in the last one and you guys were cool with that too. Um, I also ordered the friend zone which is book two in the game plan series i'm only missing this one i think i have a complete series now um i just do that i slowly pick up the used copies of the self-published paperbacks so i got that um also i opened this one right beforehand because this one came through ups um monica smith has sent this to me thank you monica you have been spoiling me and you definitely don't have to, but I appreciate it so much. Um, this is the first book in the Cavisham Heiresses. So I haven't started this series yet because at Barnes & Noble they only had books 3, 4, 5, and 6. But they're so pretty that I've been picking them up. Um, this one I love because she's like in a chemise on the bed. So this isn't really a wedding gown, but it's also really sexy. And this is the first one. So I'm really excited for that. Then I got this big box and I don't know who this is from because I didn't order this and it feels like it's full of a lot of books. So I don't know what this is. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. Who's this from? Monica. What the fuck girl? Holy shit. These are all from her. Oh my God. This is, I'm like going to cry a little bit. Holy crap. Holy crap. Okay. Wow. So I got also the second one from her. They must have sent these separately is what happened. Um, then, wow, these are all things from my wish list. Oh my God. Um, I wanted a new copy of Mine Till Midnight. This got a little beat up. That's okay. Um, so, because the copy that I have is really beat up, so I got that. Then I was asking for From Blood and Ash. I haven't read this book yet, or so now I have that. <laughs> Jeez. 
Um, Ringmaster. These are all things on my wish list. I'm going to cry. Holy crap. Um, a Secret for a Secret, which I recently just read. Loved this. This has one of the sweetest heroes that I've ever read. He's amazing. The Play. <laughs> I haven't started the Briar U series yet. And here it is for me. Jeez. I feel so spoiled. Um, Good Boy by Serena Cohen. Cohen, Serena Bowen and Al Kennedy. And The Footman and I by Valerie Bowman, which I'm really excited to get this because I just read, I was just starting the E arc for this, but it's one of those where like they put the E arc out of the book when it's like a self published. So this book actually came out in like June. And so I started the E arc and then I was like, I would really just like to own this. So this series, this is a Footman's Club. And it's very much a fan, it's very much like a fan, it's not fantasy, but like it's fantasy because it's these three lords, like one's a duke and earl and all these things and they go undercover as like, they want to find women who will actually love them for them. So it's kind of like undercover millionaire, basically. So there's that. Monica, like, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this. But you have made my day. Like, I, I'd i said on a live show the other day, like, I have to quarantine for the next two weeks. It's confirmed that um, my best friend has COVID and I spent a lot of days with her. So I'm kind of stuck at home until then. And some of these are books that are new to me and some of them are ones that I, like, wanted my own copy of them. And I just feel so blessed. Like, thank you so much. This really means a lot to me. I just like I always feel unworthy and like that people will love you and send you things that you've never met but I know how it is like there is people that I do that for too but when you're the person who like likes to get gifts it is weird to like get something back because it just feels weird but I am so <laughs> blessed to have this thank you so much you have only brought joy to my life since you started reaching out to me and god Thank you so much. There's one more package I have to open though. This one I know what it is and I'm super excited for it. This was just like Christmas come early. Like holy shit. <sighs> I'm excited. So there is a um, Etsy shop that she does nerdy things and she recently just launched and I bought a bunch, well not a bunch, I bought two things on her launch day because they're nerdy clothes. And I was like, I must have it. So I ordered two things from her right away. Um, oh, there's a cute little card. I'm sure this is like a thank you. Thanks so much for supporting my brand new Etsy shop. I'm a sucker for all things Outlander. So I think you made some really great choices because spoiler alert. So my biggest thing that I'm excited for is that she has some like, I want there to be other color options eventually, but I like don't care because her designs were so unique. And I understand that it's probably the easiest to just offer like one color of everything. So I ordered myself an Outlander Crew shirt. So this one says Claire and Jamie, Brie, Roger, and Myrta. I wish it said Ian. Like I want to like add and Ian down here because Myrta is annoying to me. So I'd rather have Ian than Murta, but I just love it. I'm going to put this on and snuggle. And then I ordered a sweater. I'm so excited about this sweater. That says Dinafash Sasna. Just so happy. So her uh, Etsy is Queen B something. I will link it down below so you can check her out. She's already like has to... Um, restock some things I know that like I jumped on it right away and when I went back in to like check the status of my order um some things were like sold out already so super excited I'm definitely gonna put these on I need to do yoga now um because since I can't leave my house I have a personal trainer and lately it's been rough as it is like I've only just been like maintaining where I'm at and now that I can't leave my house for two weeks like the gym was really the only place I was going right like the gym that's where I was going to and now I can't do that so yeah 
I need to do the yoga, do the workouts that my trainer sent me and not skimp out on them. So, yep. But anyway, after I do yoga and then take a shower, I'm going to cozy up in my sweater and read This Count Who Left Me. Actually, I'll probably read the hardcover because I'm going to annotate the hardcovers. Um, I had only highlighted the first line so far, which is, Anthony Bridgerton had always known he would die young. So, I'm super excited. But Hello. So, first check-in time. Um... Oh my gosh, this reread's going to go a lot faster than the Duke and I. Um, I can already feel, like, the step up in game. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can feel the step up in Julia's game from the Duke and I to the... Um, okay, first off, first thoughts. First thoughts that I have. Um, I am only read the prologue in the first two chapters, but it's 40 pages of the book. Because the first couple of chapters are pretty long. Um, first things first. The prologue of this book is almost the exact opposite of the prologue for The Duke and I. And it's a very stark difference to me this time. Because what we see in The Duke and I is we see this prologue of how Simon just wanted his father to love him. Um, you know when he was, well, when he was little, little, he wanted his father to love him and then his father rejects him. So he spends his whole life bettering himself to, to one up his father. And everything that he does is because he's trying to get back to be better than his father ever expected him to be in a way to stick it to his father because his father hurt him and was cruel to him when he was young. And that shaped the man that Simon was, and it shaped the decisions that Simon made about love and marriage and how he didn't want any of that. Well, in the prologue of The Viscount Who Loved Me, we see the exact opposite. And it's no less sad and tragic, but in a completely different way. So in this, we get to see Edmund and mostly focus on Edmund because Benedict has this in his heart that he does not want to outlive his father or that he doesn't think that he will outlive his father because his father was the best man. He was the best father, the best husband that he'd ever seen. And he couldn't imagine being better than his father at anything. And he had 18 years of having his father, and his father was amazing. And we get to see that. We get to see Edmund make a baby Bjorn. He invents a baby Bjorn so that he can carry Colin and Benedict around together when he goes romping around their lands, and it's adorable. And if you ever read the Bridgerton prequels, you will get to see Violet and Edmund together in little bits there it, there is never one that's just about them but it's just beautiful and it's it's a tragedy and it's a happily ever after at the same time because they have eight beautiful children together but anyway so we get to see from anthony's point of view that he had a great dad and he was very loved and has a wonderful family and however at 18 he had to become the father of his brothers and sisters, not just for emotional support and like leadership wise, but he takes on the role of being a loving father to his siblings. There's a line in the first chapter where he went to all of their piano recitals and he made sure that his brothers felt supported and made sure that they had an allowance that they needed and took care of them. And that, you know, duty has always been what his life is about. And so he knows he needs to get married. However, he saw how broken hearted his mother was. When Edmund died, Violet was pregnant with Hyacinth. Um, Hyacinth never got to know her father. Anthony's the only father that she's known. That's a totally different story. We'll get to Hyacinth someday. But Anthony knows he needs to get married, but he doesn't want to leave a wife and children with the level of grief that he felt. 
still feels because he had more time with his dad than everyone else. So he feels like he misses him the most. And he doesn't feel that way out of like, it's not an entitlement or like an asshole thing. He looks at it as fact. He's like, I spent the most time with my father of any of them. And so I feel like I lost the most. I lost my guardian. And also there is no titled Lord that like really has a dad too. Right. So even though he's like a Viscount, um, like he doesn't have a dad and while he still had that wonderful influence, he has decided of himself that he will not marry for love. He will find a nice woman. He will be a good husband, but he knows that he will die young. He believes he will die young because his father died in a really freak accident. Edmund was stung by a bee, got anaphylactic shock, we assume, and died from it. But it was a delayed reaction, too, which is medically accurate. It's a thing. Um, my father, myself, his, um, the potency of bee stings has gotten worse with each additional sting my father has had. I was with him one time when he didn't go into anaphylactic shock, but he had trouble breathing and had issues. So I always have, like, a bit of empathy for this, too. So Anthony, like, he knows that a bee is what killed his father, but he also thinks that this is so cracked that my father died because of a bee sting. So really, I could go out at any time. And because my father did, I will. So this is what I mean that he's like Simon in this way, is that though he knows what a beautiful family is, he knows what a good father is, and he does want to be a husband and a father. He is keeping a part of himself detached from it because he doesn't want a woman to love him the way that his mother loved his father, and then leave her. So he is just as cracked in the head as Simon was, but in a different way. And so I am just really picking up on the similarities this time around between Anthony and Simon, because they are, they are different sides of the same coin. One of them had a horrible father, and so he doesn't want to have children. And one of them had a wonderful father, and he needs to have children, but he doesn't want to be as attached to his wife, particularly. To his children, he would still love his children. So, there we are. There we be with everything. So, then we have Kate, who I always love Kate. <laughs> Kate is just a slap in the face in a wonderful way. She is so sassy. Um... I won't go into like all the stuff right now. I'll save some stuff for a later clip. But so far we're at the one of the balls where we're all meeting each other. And Kate has read a lot of bad things about Anthony in the gossip rags, specifically Mrs. Whistledown. And so she does not want her younger sister to marry a Bridgerton, specifically Anthony. And who does Anthony decide to set his sights on but... Edwina. And Kate is going to do whatever she can to stop that from happening. And so we get this lovely exchange between Colin and Kate, which is just adorable. Like I can't even, I said it in the last one. We just, we see Colin come back from his travels and I love him. And then in this, we see Colin and I love him. I, he steals my heart right from the jump. I just can't imagine what it was like as these books were coming out and like hope, like waiting for Colin's book, like just being ready for it because he just steals the show and him and Kate have this fun banter together. I think Kate and Colin, they're the same age. Um, I think they're both, um, 20, 21. So there's that as well. Um, and Colin knows that she doesn't like his brother and he has heard that his brother wants to marry her sister. So he's like, oh, brother, the way to get to Edwina, Kate needs to like you. So Anthony pretty quickly is like, you little punk knew that this chick didn't like me and you just like shoved us together. And it's it's bloody brilliant. The banter's so good. The love that just rolls off the page for these siblings. Like, Kate asked him, like, ask Colin, are you loyal to your family? And Colin is like, 
absolutely, unequivocally. And Kate's like, that's how I feel about Edwina. That feeling that you have, that's how I feel for my sister. And I'm not going to let her marry someone who isn't going to love her. And he's like, well, Anthony would be a good husband. Like, he's not going to cheat on her or anything. And she's like, oh, but Colin, Mr. Bridgerton, a husband can break someone's heart far more soundly than anyone else. And I wrote in my book, I was like, yes, because we just saw that happen, didn't we? Didn't we in the book previously, we saw a husband break a wife's heart and a wife break a husband's heart or betray their trust more profoundly than anyone else can. So, gosh, I'm loving this. Um, I'm stopping tonight because it's it's midnight now and I need to calm down. Hey everybody, it's time for a reading update on The Viscount Who Loved Me. So I'm 134 pages in. Um, we just got to the first steamy bit in here. So there is the certain ball that Kate and her sister and the Bridgertons are all at and there is the incident where Kate finds herself like stuck under the desk or whatever when Anthony brings the opera singer. Oh, that's right. It's the musicale. It's the musicale. That's what it is. And he brings the opera singer in to, I guess it's his office that she stumbles into and she hides under the desk and then she overhears him saying some things to the opera singer about how he doesn't need to give up a mistress if he doesn't want to she's not this opera singer isn't his mistress but she's saying that she might like to be and he's saying that maybe that could happen and she's like well aren't you gonna get married soon and he's like well if a gentleman doesn't love his wife it's not necessary for him to give up his mistress which sign of the times whatever that's not the huge issue here the huge issue here is that Kate overhears this and she already doesn't want Anthony to be with her sister and then to overhear him talking deliberately planning to number one not love her sister and number two to have a mistress. Kate is appalled mostly for the fact that he admits that he's not planning to love her sister and she's like I refuse to let my sister get into a marriage with you where you are planning not to love her which we already know this about him because that's his character trait that's set up right. And so we have this really like sexy scene though where he's trying to intimidate her and he ends up kissing her instead. And it's, it's very sexy. Like it was a, I was on a live stream with Izzy and Shay. We were doing productivity sprints this morning and I decided to read over my lunch hour while we were doing that. And I read that and I was like, ooh, this is just kissing. But like the way Julia writes it, it's in Anthony's head and he's just feeling consumed by Kate and it's very sensual and really had really got my blood flowing reading it but then his reason for kissing her is that he's trying to intimidate her and when they're done kissing she's like you know I'm never gonna let you marry my sister and he's like I know that um and then he's like um if I offered marriage to every woman that I kissed, I'd be thrown into jail for bigamy. And she says, you, sir, have no honor. And Anthony's really pissed by this. And he actually grabs her by the shoulders and he's like, that is not true. And were you a man, I'd call you out for it. So he moves from just trying to intimidate her with his presence, which turned into a kiss, to actually grabbing hold of her to the point where he might leave bruises to do that. And she actually is like, please please stop, please let me go. And he's like, I'm sorry. And he's like, I didn't mean to hurt you. And he's like, she's like, you didn't. And he says, no, I wanted to scare you perhaps, but not to hurt you. And then they get into this discussion where he's like, if you were Edwina's brother, would you allow her to marry a man like you? And we know without another statement being said that the answer is no, he wouldn't allow it because Simon, who was his best friend, he was going to kill him for doing what Simon did to Daphne is the same thing that Anthony does to Kate here. So we're seeing some hypocrisy in him and it's all super sexy. I know where we're going. I love this book. I just want us to be aware that, you know, the Duke and I is not the only book that has some of these issues in it and... Anthony is a bit of a bully because he admits that he wanted to scare her not hurt her physically but he wanted to scare her and we see him consistently kind of be a bully to Kate and part of it is like it's all a game between both of them because Kate is not 
a wilting violet and she's definitely not letting him get her with this so it's like each intimidation thing he does besides the kissing because she likes the kissing she claps back at him right away so this isn't a you know he's not a full-fledged bully because she is on the same level with him mentally but he definitely has all the power not only is he a viscount he's bigger stronger and very intimidating to her and all she has is her force of will to want the best for her sister to go against him. And that's what makes for an interesting story because we see this woman who all she has is her stepmother and her sister. Like that's all she has to her name. She has forgone a possibility of her own happiness to make sure her sister is not married to someone who won't love her. And Anthony is just treating her like she's a fly in the ointment or like a fly in his soup getting in the way. Um, even though now he's starting to have some strong sexual feelings for her. But I just wanted to call attention to that scene because I think it's one people will probably bring up. I still find it sexy, right, because I love trashy stuff like that. I, I don't mind a bully, especially a bully who's going to learn his place, which Anthony is going to learn his place. Like, spoiler alert, he will. Um, but he then takes it a step further and he actually tries to humiliate her. And this is where you really see him be a bully and you see him realize it, which is great. So a little further on after this... She's going to leave, and he'd actually locked the door when he brought the opera singer in. So he takes out the key, and he throws it to her, and he purposely throws it, like, at her feet. So she would have to bend over and pick it up. And there's this line right here where this is what it says. He says, before she had a chance to react, he reached into his pocket, pulled out the key to the study, and tossed it in her direction, deliberately aiming it at her feet. Given no warning, her reflexes were not sharp, and when she thrust out her hand to catch the key, she missed it entirely. Her hands made a hollow clapping sound as they connected, followed by the dull thud of the key hitting the carpet. She stood there for a moment, staring at the key, and he could tell the instant she realized he had not intended for her to catch it. She remained utterly still, and then she brought her eyes to his. They were blazing with hatred and something worse, disdain. That's right. Anthony felt as if he'd been punched in the gut. He fought the most ridiculous impulse to leap forward and grab the key from the carpet, to get down on one knee and hand it to her, to apologize for his conduct and beg for her forgiveness. But of course he would do none of those things. He did not want to mend this breach. He did not want her favorable opinion. Because the elusive spark, the one so noticeably absent with her sister, whom he intended to marry, crackled and burned so strongly in the room, ought to be as light as day. It seemed the room ought to be as light as day. So... That is what we're supposed to attribute his actions to, is that he's trying to widen the breach between them, um, which currently Kate only sees as hatred. She maybe thinks that he's handsome and has that, but for her, it's mostly all just, I want to protect my sister. And Anthony's the one who has, you know, a few more flutterings going on than her. Um, and he's really trying to do some things that are unforgivable so that he can widen that gap with her. So it's a classic romance hero thing to do, but I just want to bring it up because it actually like made me tear a little bit. And I think that that shows how powerful the writing is. And I always love to call those moments out because Anthony just thinks he's so suave and he's a shook, he shooketh by this kiss with her and then feeling so powerfully about it. And then he needs to, he needs to change that power balance right away by being an asshole. And it hurts. Like I, I like in the back of my throat, I got that little, like, dude, not cool, right? I got that, like, not cool, man, not cool feeling. And, yeah, it's really powerful. It's very powerful. So, I'm loving it. I am, the place where I'm at now is the Sheffields have come to the Bridgerton's country estate. Um, we're getting close to the fun part of this book. I'm excited. Um, but Kate is trying to avoid... Anthony and Violet kind of sends Anthony in the direction that Kate is to purposely because everyone else is seeing the sexual tension, which is great. I love that kind of thing. I love when everyone else knows what's going on besides the people involved. <laughs> so I definitely know Anthony. I'll be won back over by him. I love him. Just where oh, there was also something else I forgot. So this country estate that they're at is the place where um it was edmund bridgerton's favorite place and so anthony is sitting in his office at aubrey hall and he's remembering good times with his father and he says this one line which i might choke up just about to read it he sits back and he says oh father 
Anthony whispered, looking up at the portrait of Edmund that hung over the fireplace. How on earth will I ever live up to your achievements? And those achievements that he's talking about are being a good father. And that's something that just wins me back over to Anthony, like, immediately. Like, I read this stuff about him being a bully, and I'm like, gosh, you're so mean. And part of it is Kate brings that out in him. Like, Anthony does not act this way with anyone else. Like, he is not a bully to people below him or things like that. It's supposed to be that Kate and him fight like a cat and a dog because of their sexual tension. And, like, I'm here for it. I am here for it. Don't take my pointing this out to mean anything other than that. But the way that I'm won back over immediately is that it is that like Anthony is in this place at all. Anthony is looking for a wife that he won't love at all because he believes he's going to die. And he doesn't want to leave children and a wife behind as broken hearted as he himself is. So I just think that's so beautiful. And when he says like, father, how could I live up to your achievements? I just want to hug him so much because I think we get caught up in a lot of things and we don't understand how like people lived the way that they lived back then. But I'll tell you, like, that's what I aspire to have as a great achievement, to be a good parent someday if I'm so blessed to. And I believe that the only thing we're really here for is to make the world a better place. And you might do that on a grand scale. Maybe you will be someone who does it on a grand scale. But the way you make the world a better place that I feel is by having meaningful relationships with people and by raising your children to do that as they grow up. And so the fact that that Anthony, who has power, political power, wealth, all these things, his achievements that he most admires in his dad is that he was a good father. And he talks about how his father didn't discriminate between the boys and the girls. He loved the boys and girls equally. He played with them equally. He gave them all equally his love. And that Anthony sees that as the greatest achievement he could live up to. And his fear that he will die young and not be able to have that is what's truly heartbreaking about the situation that Anthony finds himself in. In a contrast to Simon's, who, instead of looking at it the way that Anthony did, where he could have children and be better than his father was, Anthony is like, how can I be as good as my father was? So, another update that ended up being 12 minutes long, but that's where I'm at. I plan to make a big dent in this today, if not finish it, because I want to be ahead of the other, like, readathon so that I can have this content out to you guys, like, as you're reading it. Um... And I already realized that I was like, oh, wow, they're catching up to me um, because I'm taking my time. But we're getting to the meat of this story now. This is all like kind of set up. So I'll plow through this, but got to go back to work for a little bit. This was my lunch hour. And then um, tonight I got another night of quarantine. So nothing going on. Just we're over halfway there now. So that's great. Whoop, whoop. Hi. So it was time for another update for the Viscount and me. Um, the Viscount who loves me. I want to keep like connecting it to the Duke and I because whatever. But the Viscount who loved me. Um, it's going good. I'm on page 200. I hesitated to stop and do this because I plan to be further ahead in the book than I am right now. But then again, like my plan is to finish today and get my get this reading blog up on Monday um, because I'm wanting to be like a week ahead of everyone in binging Bridgerton so that as people finish they're able to come and watch my reading vlog out of it. That's kind of how I like want it to work. Um, but the place we're at now I thought it was a good enough place to kind of stop and check in because we've gotten to the point where um, the Pall Mall game has just happened which I think in this book, that's a part that really stands out to everybody because it's so much fun. Like each book kind of has that one thing that just like really sticks out more than anything else, which is really fun. And this one is the Pall Mall game where they both get super competitive and it's really fun. And then that night is the big thunderstorm where Kate is in the library. She's going to get a book to read and then the thunderstorm happens and we get to see her trauma come out. Um, that she is scared of thunderstorms. Um, we don't know why yet. I mean, I know why, but like in the story, we don't know why that is yet. And of course, Anthony happens to come down to the library at that time and find her. And he really has a lot of compassion for her and sits and talks to her and talks about 
he opens his up that he also has some irrational fears. He doesn't tell her what it is, but he admits he's like, there's some things that we're afraid of that they just don't make sense. And that's like what a phobia is. Um, and then she asks him to just keep talking to her. It's so precious. And so he's like, well, what do you want me to talk about? And she's like, you know, I can tell you all like really love your dad. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your father? And there was this really beautiful line that I highlighted because Anthony asked, you know, or no, she says she's like, or he asks if she misses her mom. And she's like, I don't know. You know, I don't remember her. I mostly remember Mary as being my mom. Mary's a wonderful stepmom and mom to her. Um, and her father actually married very quickly to give her a mom um, because he wanted her to have someone to love her. But then Anthony asks, you know, do you miss her? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know if I just miss the idea of her, if I miss her. But I've lost a parent both when I was a child and when I was a grown up because her father recently died. And she's like, they both hurt. They just hurt in different ways. And that was really powerful um, and really resonated with me because as being someone who, I mean, my parents aren't uh, about to die or anything, but I will lose a parent when I'm an adult, most likely, right? And I have friends and family members who have lost, you know, when you're an adult and it's like, I can't imagine losing someone as a child, but I also can't imagine like having all those years with someone and you know them so much better. And that's only if you have like a perfect relationship with them, because that's what Anthony is saying is he's like, no age is the right age for a boy to lose his dad. And I was like, stop, stop. Um, but it's so good. So, um, this update, I just wanted to make really quick because we're right before the point where um, they're going to start getting together. I'm literally at the chapter where they're going to have their thing, but I'm probably going to read through to the end and then like wrap it all up. So I just wanted to drop in real quick, but obviously it's still going really well. I've highlighted so much in this one as well in my annotating because it's just so funny. This one definitely has like the Duke and I has a lighthearted beginning but then things get pretty serious and like uncomfortable. And I mean, there's going to be stuff we have to go through, but this one just stays a little more like lighthearted all the way through. Like even the way that Kate is about to get ruined is kind of like sad, tragic, hilarious, all of these things wrapped into one. So definitely excited for that. So I will be back when we wrap this all up. So I'm really excited. Oh, also side note, um, today is the last day of my quarantine. So I get to go to church tomorrow and I'm really excited about it. It's gonna be great. Hey, so it's the next day from the last clip where I was like, I'm gonna finish this tonight, which I did finish it last night, but it was pretty late at night because, oh my gosh, I just got distracted by things. Yesterday was the end of my quarantine, which I think I said that, I can't remember. Um, and so I just was like doing a lot of stuff that I hadn't been able to do and I got to see my best friend and it was cool. And then it was the live show for the Duke and I last night, which if you haven't watched it, um, I highly recommend that you do because I know I felt really good about it. I was pretty nervous about it just because I, it's not that it's an unpopular opinion, but having to like rationalize why you don't think a certain scene is rape is just hard, but it's something that I will always do for that book because the problems that I had with that book, they weren't that. And so if you're curious, um, the wonderful creators of the Binging Bridgerton readathon, which I tip my hat, my hands, clap them for the ladies because it is beautifully put together. And I, really appreciated everyone's thoughtful opinions. Not that I thought they'd be anything less. We have a wide range of people's thoughts and things that we were talking about. And I think it was a consensus, like nobody really gave it five stars that maybe read this for the first time, read that for the first time, but I'm not here to talk about the Duke and I, we're talking about the Viscount who loved me. So let's get back to that. But I will say, since this is going up like two days after, if you go to Jess's channel, Peace Love Books, in case you didn't know, you can see the whole thing, including a statement that Chris reads that she got from Julia Quinn herself because Julia was so gracious as to reply and share what she thought about the scene when she wrote it. Then, how she's seen culture change, 
Um, and it was just very validating to me that I interpreted the story the way that she did. There's no right way to interpret a story because you can have valid feelings about anything you want to, but I just felt like there was a specific way I was interpreting this that I have interpreted it as for a long time. And it just felt really good as a long time lover of the book to know that I wasn't being insensitive or whatever. Um, but anyway, that's enough of that tirade. Please go check that live show out. It was amazing. Um, and we're going to talk about this. So I put the cover back on and it's really shiny, but just one more time, y'all. Let's just look at this. It's so pretty. I love them. We'll set them up here by Jamie and Claire. That'll look real cute. But okay, how to wrap this up. This part of the vlog is always the longest because I did have about half of the book left when I made the last clip. The first half just takes me a long time and it did that for the first one. It's going to do that for all of them because here's the thing I'm realizing about this series specifically. On the reread, like I love all the bantery stuff and everything, but I also have a lot of it like memorized in my heart. So I get distracted from it really easily because this is my third, fourth, fifth, sixth reread of these books. And that's why I'm glad I'm annotating it this time because it's making me pay attention. But at the same time, there's like two strikes against each of these books for that. Number one, historical romance, I usually listen to it these days. It's just kind of like a theater situation for me, you know, like audible theater. And I really enjoy listening to historical romance specifically these days. Um, and so even though it's my favorite author, some of my favorite books, to need to physically have the book in my hand and I'm annotating it, so it's not even my Kindle where I can like bring it with and stuff. I kind of can only read this one at home because I have my pen and I'm writing in it and everything. And it's just a little bit more work to stay focused. And so during that first half of, of both of these books where there's just that bantery, cute, sweet stuff, which I love it. I'm sure you saw me, you know, I, I ranted about that in the early part of the video. I love it it still isn't like super attention grabbing for me. But once we get to the tipping point, which specifically in this one is when Anthony ruins Kate in front of the biggest gossip um, in the land, uh, the F Mrs. Featherington, they have to get married. And from that tipping point, I really love it because we just see Anthony start to lose control in a very interesting way. He already has been losing control around Kate during the whole book. I love Kate. She just pushes his buttons and is the perfect person for him. Um, to the point where like, he really loses a lot of his good behavior. Um, he's pretty mean. He's kind of cruel to Kate. And so if I didn't know where that was going, like there's a couple times where like I teared up because of the things he was saying to her. And I know that he has a good, like he has a good, I wouldn't call it a straight up grovel, but he has a good period of time where he is making that up to her. So I'm able to forgive him. But it was funny when I looked at my rating again, because I haven't been, I haven't been looking at what I've rated them before, before this reread. And so I actually had rated it as a 4.25 last time, but set it out of four on Goodreads. And this time when I was finished, I felt like it was a 4.5 and I upped it to a five star on Goodreads just because, I don't know, I appreciated Kate a lot more and Anthony just... I really felt like I got him more than I ever have before. Like I just felt Anthony and um, I said this in the beginning of my vlog, um, there is such a stark contrast between the way he was raised and the way Simon was raised. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing that. Um, I don't know how I never noticed it before, but there was just something about um, maybe because I was paying so much attention that like, Simon is afraid to get married because he refuses to have kids. Like, not even afraid. He's just like, I'm never going to get married and have kids. Whereas Anthony knows he needs to get married and have kids because he needs to carry on the, the line, the Bridgerton line. But he's afraid of loving someone. And that twists his character in a completely different way because as soon as he starts having these sparks with Kate, um he's like on red alert. He's like, I need to cut this. I need to hurt her if I can. I need her to stop butting heads with me. And I just need it to stop because I'm getting feelings and I'm feeling attraction. And like, I can't love the woman that I marry because I will break her, which is so foolish. And I love in this book 
more so than in the Duke and I, that we really saw the hero like, uh, I don't know, it's hard. Because th the problem I also had with this book is I feel like both characters just snapped so well. Like, there's the part where once Kate has her nightmares and Anthony sees it, he's like, we need to, we need to talk about this. Like, why are you having nightmares when it thunders and lightning? And so they go talk to her stepmother and her stepmother explains that the night of a huge storm is the night your mother died and you actually saw her dead body and like you were traumatized by it. And I didn't want to bring it up to you because I thought you were over it. And so I just wrapped you up in my love and I tried to be your mom and I thought you were okay. And oh, number one, like we're about to see in in a, in a in the next book a horrible stepmother um and i enjoy okay here's the thing i enjoy an evil stepmother as much as the next person does but i also love when step parents literally become a surrogate parent and never want to replace the other parent but they want to be as loving as possible and in fact love you even more because you're missing that original mom like I just read um, Make Me Yours by Melanie Harlow which also has a widower marrying someone else and the 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 dad always says like you're gonna have a bonus mom like you already had a mom and even in that case like the mom died at childbirth um, but he always wanted her to remember her mom and he's like you're not getting a new mom you're getting a bonus mom and I was like that is the cutest thing I've ever heard but anyway so I love how Anthony helps her with that, but then, but then he's jealous. He's jealous that Kate was able to get over it. And the thing, again, that I think is a little hinky is that after she talks with her about it, she's like, I don't think I'm going to have nightmares anymore. <laughs> I think they're done. And I was just like, mm. we never know if she has another one or not because we don't get to see it. But I'm like... I don't think that your nightmares are over that quickly and I think that's a bit of a statement for Julia to just be like, ah, oh, you're gonna be fixed now <laughs> because I was so happy we talked about it but I would have liked that we got to see a storm where maybe she was still scared but like she didn't have a waking nightmare like she did. I don't know. Didn't like that a ton. But I do like the reaction that Anthony has where he's jealous that she has been able to work through her problems because as an intelligent man, Anthony knows that it's irrational that he believes he will die the same year that her father did, but he can't make himself believe it. So then we get to our dark moment where I actually love it. Like he wants to just, he's so mad at himself, but he can't let it go because he realizes that he loves Kate and he doesn't know what to do about it. Like he's like, ugh. And so he has his dark moment and then the Bridgerton bros step in. I called them the BBs to the rescue again because he runs away to home and Kate, like Eloise writes her a letter and is like, Hey, my brother showed up and he is hiding and like, you should come and talk to him because, and she's like, thanks Eloise. And so this is the first we see that Eloise is kind of a sneaky sneak. We get to see her be a bit of a sneaky sneak. Um, but all for the help of her brother. Cause she's like, please go talk to my brother now. So he stops being an idiot. And I'm like, ah, the Bridgerton siblings. I love them. And so Eloise brings her over and Kate goes to talk to him. And he finally, well, he doesn't, I don't think he explains it at that moment, but he, she's like, I'm here for you. And he like wants to have sex with her, but he's like, I am not going to use her for this. So he's like, leave. And he makes her feel really small and little and makes her go home. And, and again, so I love this, but again, I'm like, Julia, what are you doing? We, we skip over all this good stuff. Like I really wanted him to talk with his mother about it the way that we talked with Mary Kate's, you know, stepmom about it. But all it takes is, so he's like scared her away. And then Kate, like, Kate goes home and then Colin and Benedict are like, dude, it's not a big deal. Go home and love your wife. And he's just like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to love her for all the time that I have left, which is great. But you know what conversation is missing? I'm going to tell you because I figured it out this time. I figured it out this time why I've never been satisfied because what needed to happen, what needed to happen is Anthony needed to talk to Violet because Violet is in the position that Anthony believes he'd be leaving a wife in. 
a wife with children who he loved so much. So, and he has a great relationship with his mother. So why didn't he talk to Violet? He should have went and said, hey mom, would it have been better if you didn't love dad the way you did? If he had kept himself apart from you and then randomly died, would it have been better? Or do you not regret a day you spent with him for 20 years loving him as fiercely as you could and now you've been alone for the last 10 years? Like which one is better? Julia, I'm telling you. Well, I'm not talking to you. Don't watch this video because I feel like a horrible person. But I am saying this. If that conversation was in this book, six stars. Six stars freaking stars because that's all that I'm missing the thing that I'm missing is that like snap into place where Anth where I believe that Anthony understands how foolish that he's being because he kind of does that but like why didn't we bring Violet into it we love Violet and she's the person who's in the best position to answer Anthony's fears and say no I'm glad your father didn't keep himself apart from me it is the best relationship of my life and it's because I loved him so much and we have these beautiful children that I'm able to like go on with my life and I don't regret a day that we lived. So that's what's missing from this book, in my opinion. But then we have a beautiful wrap up like where he walks through his problems with Kate, which is good. It's good. I'm just saying that snap moment because Kate gets hurt. She breaks her leg actually in an accident and that's his moment and I'm not a huge fan of hero or heroine having to be in a life or death situation to make their love realized it's believable but now that I have thought of this quote-unquote perfect solution I'm kind of like dude dude why didn't we have that <laughs> but hindsight's 2020 I'm not backseat authoring but that's what I do I analyze books and I'm telling you that's where I feel unsatisfied in an otherwise almost perfect book is that First, Kate just realizes she's okay, but then Anthony is just like, nope, I love her and I don't care. And I'm like, but Violet could have made it okay. So Violet could have been like, you've been struggling with this for 10 years, believing you were going to die. Like hearing that from Violet, I, number one, I would have made her so sad because like, like when Kate gets stung and he like is sucking on, sucking on her, like flesh here to get the bee out and he looks at his mom and is like she was stung by a bee and Violet's like honey you know like she she sees that so I feel like it could have been great if there was a follow-up conversation like we never not only was Anthony the one that knew his father for the longest but he's known his mother for the longest and that's what's missing for me but okay I'll stop rambling about it this book guys it's really great I I've read this five or six times um, I think this is the first time it has fully surpassed the first book for me because I've always kind of liked these two like equally well, but after this time around, I do think that this book is much better, not much, but like better, um, and almost perfect to me. I adore Anthony and Kate. Um, I love watching him just like slowly melt for her. I love, there is a scene too that like, okay, we got to talk about this too, where he, she has always been like considered second best to her younger sister and she's okay with that. She loves her younger sister. She, you know, that's the whole reason she has a hate to love with Anthony is because he wants her sister and she's like, he's not good enough for you. So it's not going to happen. Right. Um, and then so when they're going, like, so she has her sex talk with Mary, which it's a little better of a sex talk than we got in the first one, but still not great because nobody talks about the mechanics of it. Or, you know, all that happens is like, if you have a good husband, you'll like it. And if you have a bad husband, you don't. There's no conversation about like any of it, which I get, I'm used to it. Historical romance, that's my jam. I'm used to it. Um, but we still get a little bit more of a sex talk. But the main thing that Kate takes away from that is that a man, he can have a good time no matter what. And Kate is really nervous that he's going to be picturing someone else to have a good time. And Anthony hasn't done a great job of assuaging her fears that, yeah, this is a marriage of like a forced marriage because of him ruining her, but that he is still really into her. And he's already told her that like, this isn't going to be a marriage of love. So he's just stacked up all of her worries. And so then they are having their wedding night. And it's going good. Like we are, we are in, we're having a great time. And then 
dude's having a great time. So he like throws his head back and closes his eyes, which is just like, I'm like, oh, I love it. Ugh. And Kate is like, wait, who are you thinking about? And it's like, he's literally in and like so close to the end. And then it's like, whoosh, what? What are you talking about? She's like, well, you just called me beautiful and you close your eyes and I'm not beautiful. And I think I got to find it because I think we got to read it. Let me find it. So then he says this, which he should have said before. He says this, listen to me. He said his voice, even and intense and listen well, because I'm only going to say this once. I desire you. I burn for you. I can't sleep at night for wanting you. Even when I didn't like you, I lusted for you. It's the most maddening, beguiling, damnable thing, but there it is. And if I hear one more word of nonsense from your lips, I'm going to have to tie you to the bloody bed and have my way with you in a hundred ways until you finally get it through your silly skull that you are the most beautiful and desirable woman in England and everyone else who doesn't see that, they're bloody fools. Um, and then they have a happy ending <laughs> in that sense. We're still a little ways from that. So. Anthony does a great job in the second half of this book showing her how desirable he finds her to be. But in the moment, it is one of the most like gut wrenching sex scenes you've ever read because he could not be more turned on by this beautiful, sexy woman that has just lit him up. And she's like, who are you picturing? Because it can't be me. And I'm like, oh, baby. Oh, baby. No, no. So. Kate's amazing. I can't wait to like rank all this at the end because I don't even remember what I feel about other people in the moment, but this was good. So I'll wrap this up now. This is another like hour long reading vlog or whatever, but I love this. It's a 4.5 star for me. It's fabulous. Um, I next is an offer from a gentleman. I'm a little bit nervous about that one because I'm not a big fan of Benny, not a big fan of Benedict, but I'm excited to annotate and really analyze him, but he's the most like shallow and annoying to me. Um, so I'm just being honest, but we'll see how I feel. I still love like a lower rated Bridgerton book is still a four for me. So there you go. But all right. Thank you so much for watching this. I do also want to say a wonderful thank you to my newest patron, Sarah not patron, channel member, but you know what I mean. You're a patron of my arts. Um, Sarah just recently joined. This is the first video I'm filming since she did. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining my channel. She joined at the dedicated diva level. Um, or romantic renegade? I honestly don't know, but you're here and I'm happy to have you um, in my romance community. <laughs> thank you so much for watching this, everyone. If you want to learn more about channel memberships, you can do that down below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.